Hello, I'm Marcia Kavanaugh. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, while we agree with the mayor that New Orleans has not become the Wild West, a gunfight over the weekend certainly brought to mind the OK Corral. We'll look tonight at the incident near Elk Place and the police response. We'll also examine the concerning rise in juvenile crime in Orleans Parish, a major fire at an uptown mansion causes historic losses and impacts carnival history. At City Hall, there is a plan in the early stages for developing a process to fill the monument spaces, and the New Orleans City Council took on the energy plant issue. And as bishops convene in Rome to face the child predator issue, we'll look back at an early case in Louisiana that drew attention to the matter. Joining us are tonight's Informed Sources, Errol Laborde, producer of Informed Sources, Mike Perlstein, investigative reporter, WWL-TV Channel 4, Kevin Litton, reporter, NOLA.com, The Times, Picayune, and Jason Barry, author of Books on Catholicism, as well as New Orleans Culture and Music. All right, first we're going to go over to Errol and just a major fire on an, at an historic mansion, a family's home with a lot of history of Carnival. Yeah. You know, we take it for granted because it's always been there if we've lived in New Orleans, but, you know, St. Charles Avenue is considered to be one of the great avenues in the country. Uh, I saw one rating, they call it the best avenue in the country in terms of its being picturesque and the, and the architecture and just there's so much to it with the, the streetcars and the oak trees and the, and, the, uh, and, and the beauty of the mansions, it's, it's an important thing. And this is a story you can look at in three levels. One is the human tragedy of any time that a family suffers a, a house fire, uh, uh, regardless of the income or level, I mean, it was, it was a tragic story. But also the architectural story in terms of St. Charles Avenue and the, um, and the carnival-related story. In terms of the architectural uh, um, story, this was built in 1865, and Henry Howard, who is one of the famous architects in New Orleans, uh, was the original architect. And then a little bit later, uh, it went through several renovations and modifications. Thomas Sully, who was another famous architect in New Orleans, also worked on it. And so it's been at the hand of, uh, of great architects. In um, 1906, uh, a man named Downman uh, bought the house, and uh, 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 Charles Downman, he was a real estate developer, and he was in the lumber business. And at the time, they were developing what we know as Eastern New Orleans, and, and Downman Road was, uh, uh, was named after him. In 1907, he was Rex. Uh, uh, and because of that, there was this tradition that every year when the parade went down to St. Charles, it would stop at his house, and they would, uh, they'd have a toast. But that family, the, 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 if you notice, it's a, there's a lot of names to, to the family. It's the, uh, uh, the Cock, Downman, Grace, Montgomery, uh, Montgomery. Montgomery. Montgomery House. Mm -hmm. But they're all, it's not like four separate ownership groups. It was all just through marriage continuity. And so it has been, um, it has been the same family. But there have been a lot of connections with Rex and with Comus. And it used to be famous around this time of the year. Uh, with Carnival, where they put up the flags if there's a house that had a, a reigning king or, or, or queen of Carnival or, or, or of Comus. But through that, through those two crews, uh, those really developed the Mardi Gras as, as we know it, of, of the New Orleans-style Mardi Gras. And so they were, very, uh, they were very important in the evolution of that tradition. And the New Orleans Mardi Gras is really the American Mardi Gras. It's really the way that most of the country um, celebrates it. And so... In that way, it was very um, historic also. What we're waiting to find out is what was saved, what was saved with some of the artifacts. And uh, there were some indications yesterday that uh, there were some few things uh, that were saved. There was a, a very special chalice, which was Mr. Dalman's chalice, that was used all these years to actually toast Rex. Mm -hmm. And as of, uh, as of today, we don't know if that was saved or not. But it's just um, a, a very important piece of history. Because the toast of Rex would be there at the house, right? right Rex right. would actually circle yeah, around. The parade would St. come down Rock. one side of St. Charles, and then when it got to 3rd Street, it would turn over, uh, it, would, it would turn left and cross the street, and then they'd have the toast. Now, they've already said, uh, the Rex organization has said they're going to do something there on that site right. on, on Mardi Gras, and so there, there will be something uh, going on there. Still there. I, you know, it's certainly an historic place ar architecturally and then for carnival history, but as you pointed out, it's a family's home, and it's been in the family for over a hundred years. But it's it's a place where people live, where families have been brought up, where children have been brought up, grandchildren are enjoying. As I read a quote from Anne Grace. She and her husband are the the present owners of the house, and her mom was in there. Unfortunately, all of them were rescued along with their pet. 
Um, but, uh, you know, she had called it just the grand old lady, and, yeah. you know, she really served the house well, and she served the community well. I mean, the family was so generous in opening up the house. And also um, there was a multifamily the apartment complex yeah. right next, next door, door right. and the fire department did a good job of getting the people out in time, and as it, as it happened, it didn't catch on fire, but it could have. It could have been a major disaster that would have really spread. And I, I tell you, the preliminary indications, when you look at it, uh, a lot of praise goes to the New Orleans Fire Department. It seems like they did a really good job on it. Well, certainly the community, I think, has shown the, the family. We really, our hearts go out to them for the sure. loss of their home. Best of luck to them and hopefully restoring that beautiful place. They Alrighty. said they will. Yeah, okay. That, uh, it would be wonderful if they can. <laughs> All righty, thanks a lot. Um, Mike, over to you. An incident this past weekend that had a lot of people very concerned, too, was a shootout at Elk Place and Canal between police and a suspect. That's right, and this began with the police spotting someone who had been wanted in a couple of armed robberies. Locally, what was not known was that this person um, had recently come from Texas. His name is Reginald Bercy, age 32. He was wanted in Texas for some time uh, for some serious crimes there, but as uh, officers, and we heard the radio traffic um, of officers spotting him in some clothing that he had purchased with a stolen credit card. And in trying to figure out, you know, how to make a stop, question, and potentially apprehend him, he breaks and runs. He turns the corner where there's a major bus stop at Canal and Elk Place, pulls a gun, and then from there, we don't know all of the facts. The matter is still under investigation. But according to police, he opens fire on officers. At some point, officers return fire. In the midst of that chaos, five bystanders are hit, wounded, one critically. He, the gunman, continues to run down Elk, um, makes it to the front of the Tulane Hospital complex, ducks mm -hmm. into some bushes where the shootout continues, and he's fatally shot by the police. It included two New Orleans police officers who have confirmed to um, have shot their weapons along with one state police trooper. What we don't know are which bullets were the ones responsible for hitting those five bystanders. Was it <coughs> Reginald Bercy, the suspect in the case, or was it stray fire from police officers, which raises a whole bunch of questions about the wisdom of officers shooting into a crowd, the, the training that they go through, and this would include the state police as well, is to hold fire when you could put innocent citizens at risk, but at times it runs counter to another part of police training, which is that if you are under the threat of death or great bodily harm, then you act in a way to neutralize that threat. So we have a lot of different eyes investigating the matter simply because it involves the state police and their internal affairs, New Orleans police with their public integrity bureau. Under the consent decree, there's also a force uh, investigation team fit, and then the FBI often sits in on some of the bigger PIB cases, so they're also involved. So ultimately, uh, they will sort through whatever evidence they can. Now, unfortunately, we have been able to find out that normally there would be police body camera mm -hmm. uh, that would capture at least some of the incident. In this case, the two officers who tried to make the initial stop, and presumably the ones that opened fire, were detectives, not required to wear body cameras, so they were not. The state police is not required to wear body cams, so we don't have the body, the direct body camera footage. Some other officers who responded to the scene very well may have. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, usually go to businesses and other surveillance cameras just to get all the angles possible, but it's sort of gone quiet since the incident unfolded, so we really have to wait for this investigation to unfold. The five bystanders, how are they? they were uh, two underwent pretty major surgery. I think four are out of the hospital, one remains, uh, the one who's in critical condition remains hospitalized, but um, the, the other four, those injuries were considered non-life threatening. We, we don't know other than they call the one that the person who's still in the hospital in a stable condition, but you can be critical and stable, mm -hmm. um, but at least the person is stabilized. I was, what, a, <clears throat> what a place to approach someone. I mean, that 
particular bus stop and that whole area right. is one of the busiest bus um, depots kind of in the city that we've talked about it for other issues. Yeah. Like, you know, I heard that address. So I was what, like, wow, was he approached at the bus stop or on well, Canal? They, he I think they spotted him the on Canal. Yeah. And uh, undetermined what led the suspect to then run, uh, I think, you know, the police, we did, heard the radio traffic of them spotting him. He, at something maybe alerted him that, you know, police were now um, on to him, and he bolts directly down Elk, major bus stop, all kinds of different bus lines And according to the police, there. begins firing his gun. And right? he fired the first shots, but again, we still have to find out who fired those shots that hit those bystanders. Okay. All right, Mike, thanks a lot. Kevin, we're going to go over to you. Some action over in city council over the past week or so now uh, regarding the Entergy gas plant. Um, yesterday, full council meeting, last week, committee, you were there for both, for both. of them. Action is an understatement, <laughs> i got to say. This was one of the wildest <laughs> couple of council meetings that I've seen. But let's start with the news. Mm -hmm. The news is, is that um, the council was thought to be moving in the direction of possibly reconsidering their vote on the power plant that they want to build out in New Orleans East. And New Orleans East is really sensitive about this issue because they had Mishu out there, but they say, Entergy says, we need to replace Mishu's de decommission in 2016. We need this power plant. You get the old council approves it six to one, very controversially. The paid actors scandal breaks, mm -hmm. and now this new council is kind of like, hey, maybe we can reconsider this vote. Then they start realizing, wait a second, a lot of money has been spent on this. Litigation could be there if you know if it got canceled. So as Helena Marino, the councilwoman, uh, she chairs the utility meeting, and as this process moved forward, she starts saying, wait a second, let's put the brakes on this a little bit. Maybe we are not going to be able to reconsider this at all. So that gets people really upset because they sort of had their hopes up. So I just I want to go through like some of the crazy stuff okay. at this council meeting. Uh, council member Jake Jay Banks starts out by saying. There's going to be three-headed babies. People are saying there's going to be birth defects. And is this the committee meeting? Is this, this is the committee, committee meeting. Okay. Then uh, Entergy tried to get their fine called a donation at first, and then it was a, <laughs> and then it was like a settlement, and they're and they're like, no, 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 this is a fine. This is a penalty. A man shows up in a chicken suit. <laughs> uh, they threw NFL penalty flags, which they brought with them when they didn't like something. Uh, they were singing hymns. They accused the council of being Republicans. They were chanting, do your job. They accused them of conflicts of interest. Uh, somebody accused a council member of hiding their comment card. And then, amazingly, the Vietnamese community, because they're so sensitive about this in New Orleans, showed up and were screaming at Councilwoman Cindy Wynn when she said she wouldn't recuse, and that was a whole exchange that I had never seen because it was in Vietnamese, and this was just, you know, it's the wildest council meeting I've attended, although I will say I didn't uh, cover monuments, and I think that got pretty crazy, too. And then the full committee yesterday, I mean, full council yesterday, they voted on this. So they voted on this, and they said, yeah, and by an even wider margin, you meant unanimously, mm -hmm. they say we're not going to reconsider this plant, but we are going to put some cost caps on it. We are going to make sure that Entergy is going to look at renewables as part of this, and we're going to approve that fine. So there's a $5 million fine that Entergy is now going to be paying for their paid actor scandal. Now, you said yesterday was mild compared to last week. Well, I was watching some of the proceedings online, and it was still pretty active, a lot of opposition. I mean, there's a lot of passion and a lot of folks there, you know, whether they're there for environmental reasons, for cost reasons, there's many reasons to be there. I think the big takeaway that I had in it is that people have really lost trust in their utilities here. Between Sewerage and Water Board and Entergy, yeah. people are really angry. You know, one question, uh, one point that kept uh, coming up with the opponents to it is how can you guarantee this plant will flood like the other one did if, because this one is supposed to make sure to take care of us if there's another Katrina event. What's the, you know, what's the response to that? How well, they that? say that the levees have been built back up to the point where that area shouldn't flood. But the, I mean, the truth is, I mean, that is an area that's susceptible to flooding. Mishu flooded during Katrina. We're looking into some things now. It, there's a nonprofit group that has raised some questions about whether or not this would actually affect the levees by building the plant there. So I think, you know, the jury is still out in terms of getting the full picture of how that's going to work with flooding. But right now they've approved it as if it will not flood. Are the opponents uh, saying any legal action, or is this? Yeah, there is ongoing legal action, um, li litigation, civil court, and then there also s a lawsuit that was just filed against DEQ for their um, clean air approval. It also yep. sounds like the opponents yeah. raised some technical <coughs> issues on whether this plant is really needed. 
for the you know occasional high usage you know peak periods and I think that also might come out you know, in ongoing litigation. It's a really good point. I mean, that was council's reason for approving it, basically saying, look, we agree, it's needed. We need our own power generation within the city. Okay, all righty. Thanks a lot, Kevin. Jason, over to you. Um, in Rome, uh, bishops are convening and trying to deal with the um, sexual predator issue among the priesthood, um, or clergy, I should say, and religious. Um, but you, you started looking into this issue way back in the 70s. Why don't you backtrack a little bit for us and then tell us what's going on today? Actually, it was 1985, but <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I did a, a, a big series uh, in 1985 on a number of cases in Cajun country, which was sort of the first uh, big treatment journalistically, and it has moved in, in a series of waves of media coverage uh, ever since. I mean, the issue then as now is the dynamics of the cover-up and why so many bishops uh, chose to recycle sex offenders rather than remove them. And of course, the, the issue linked to that is why they did not report them to law enforcement. Much of what has happened in the last year between the removal of Cardinal McCarrick, he's now been actually defrocked, mm -hmm. he was formerly the Cardinal of Washington, D.C., because of events like this in his past that uh, came to light through lawsuits and the grand jury report in Pennsylvania, both have sort of um, unearthed this netherworld of, um, well, it's a criminal sexual underground that many other reports and grand jury investigations have gotten at, but it's sort of hit critical mass now. At the same time in Rome, Pope Francis has defrocked several bishops. And although he himself has made some mistakes that have caused survivors to attack him verbally, this conference that has just begun is historic in that it's the first time the leaders of bishop conf bishops' conferences from around the world have gathered. What kind of this. response? Let's go back to the 80s. That's when you began reporting mm -hmm. on offenses that allegedly or did happen in the 70s. Backtrack a little bit for us. The, mm -hmm. um, the priest at that time was Gilbert Gauthier. Go Gauthier. Yeah. Gauthier. What, what kind of response did you get to your reporting at that time about this? Um, the Times of Acadiana, the weekly paper that I wrote for in, in a joint assignment with National Catholic Reporter, uh, got a favorable mail and many more favorable phone calls. We knew some people in a historically Catholic area would not like it. What we did not anticipate was getting attacked by the daily advertiser newspaper. I was called a vulture of yellow journalism and other things. Uh, and there was a boycott against the newspaper, mm -hmm. fomented by the late uh, Judge Edmund Reggie and a prominent Monsignor. The paper, which was billing at about a million a year, uh, lost $20,000. Steve May and Cherry May, who were the publishers and now live in New Orleans, are good friends of mine. We carried the day. I mean, they tried to attack the messenger, the message got out, and the story continued. I wrote about it in Lead Us Not Into Temptation, the 1992 book. I think what is so striking today is that we have a pope who is genuinely moving in the right direction, and he is saddled by his own bureaucracy, the Roman Curia. Uh, there's a book that's just come out in five languages. It's called In the Closet of the Vatican. It's getting a lot of news attention. It's a French journalist and sociologist, uh, the author Frédéric Martin, and he basically accuses the Curia of being about 80 percent gay. That does not mean all of them are sexually active, but what he's arguing is that there is a culture of concealment and cover-up and this is the netherworld that Francis has to navigate. So, Jason, just going back to the Lafayette story, mm -hmm. part of the story, you have the priest, um, Gilbert Gauthier, yeah. but an attorney who was brought in to defend him, and it seemed like that the attorney had an awakening about this world, too, that he didn't realize. Yeah, Ray Mouton was the lawyer, uh, and a very good lawyer, a descendant of the founder of uh, Lafayette, a uh, local aristocrat. Yeah, Ray had a, a, a crisis of conscience. Uh, I interviewed him for long hours and portray him in some depth in the book. Um, 
You know, many of the lawyers who have been drawn into cases like this, whether uh, on the defense side, uh, defending the church, defending insurance companies, uh, or even the plaintiff attorneys representing the families who are Catholic, all of them have gone through uh, intense soul searching. It is not uh, an easy uh, subject to uh, to have to litigate or to have to defend someone. And let me jump in yes. really quickly right here. If you could, do, what can we expect out of this? If you can just briefly explain what should. Oh, I think there'll be a major document committing the bishops to a sort of version of best practices, if you will. Look, here's what they need. The one thing they need to do is create an independent criminal court in the Vatican um, that would supersede canon law. And if Pope Francis were to do that, it may not happen immediately, but ultimately it will put the bishops under the authority of a separation of powers. Has he said that he's inclined to do this? What you were recommending? No, 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 not yet. Okay, so we shall see what comes out see. of what comes out of Rome. All right, thanks so much, Jason. Sure. Mike, over to you. Juvenile crime in Orleans. We see an uptick. Right, and I was sparked to do this just by seeing and occasionally writing about individual instances of juveniles, sometimes as young as you know, 15, 14, even 13, involved in horrific crimes of violence, carjackings, armed robberies, some shootings, and in researching, you know, the trend. I found out that there was really no year-to-year um, -year reporting on the number of juvenile violent crimes. You can go to the police and get the overall number of you know, juvenile arrests, but so many of those can range from you know, curfew, school fights, but the juvenile violent crimes, which seem to be epidemic, sure enough, when I finally was able to get those statistics from juvenile court, it's shocking. That, and I'll just give you the stats, in 2015, 37 accepted cases of juvenile crimes of violence by the district attorney's office. That is, shootings up to murder, uh, armed robberies, and sexual assaults. 37. In 2018, 339. That's just a, an enormous jump. So what that's more happened? than a nine-fold increase, almost ten-fold increase. And what you are seeing is an epidemic in New Orleans. It's not happening in Jefferson Parish or, or other surrounding parishes. And for whatever reason, uh, younger and younger offenders are emboldened to pick up a gun um, and you know, commit extremely brazen crimes. And, and there's been some criticism of the court, of the juvenile court judges, in just letting these offenders out. Well, what you have is a dynamic, and it comes at a really critical time where the court is following national best practices and some scientific studies showing that you know, locking up juveniles and the law in Louisiana matches the laws in many other parts of the country where you, you can't lock up juveniles indefinitely unless you try them as adults. But for the, for the most part, juvenile life is age 21. So they're going to get out. So what is the best way to protect public safety? And it turns out that detaining juveniles, especially in uh, lockups that do not have rehabilitative services, they come out worse than when they went in. So the conventional thinking now is to provide rehabilitation services and keep them with their families and back in the community in lieu of detention. Are there the services there? Do they exist? Well, so the problem in New Orleans is they've adopted the philosophy of rehabilitation over detention, but they don't have the funding for these services. So to police and District Attorney Leon Canizero has been very outspoken that they're running a revolving door that's, you know, allowing juveniles to feel there's no repercussions for their actions. They climb the criminal ladder to the point where they're picking up guns going on, not just you know, an individual robbery, but robbery sprees Mike. with packs of 15 and 16 year olds. Mike, you say picking up guns. How easy is it for a 13 year old kid who presumably doesn't have much money to pick up a gun? Well, unfortunately, you know, it, it's a state that is saturated with guns, number one, but one of the I guess popular crimes now is to pull on door handles, burglarize cars. Many gun owners keep guns in their glove compartment, under their seat. All the juvenile has to do is hit the right car, come up with a gun, boom. They see now the opportunity. These are very rash, impulsive crimes of opportunity, but a juvenile with a gun, and part of the science here is that you know juveniles don't appreciate long-term consequences the way adults might. And they see a gun, they see an opportunity to use the gun, 
and take what they want. Is this a trend that we're continuing to see move upward? Well, like I said, you know, it went from 37 to 339 cases of, of you know, mm -hmm. juvenile violence. Uh, I did part one of a two-part series last night and another coming up coming tonight to that does look at the potential remedies and even more importantly, the lack of funding for them. And, you know, the problem is probably going to get worse before it gets better. Just one more note on that. There's a raise the age statewide law where 17 year olds will now all be handled in the juvenile system, whereas before they were handled in the, in adult, the adult court. System. Okay, Mike, thanks a lot. You got a minute now, <laughs> Kevin, but real quick, there's a committee that has come together to at least talk about a process for replacing monuments. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that kind of got left undone with Mitchell Andrews administration was they got the monuments down, but they didn't figure out where they were going to put them. And so now we're coming up second Mardi Gras, nothing at Lee Circle. So I've kind of been pushing to say, what's the process you're going to use? Mm -hmm. The mayor wants the Human Relations Commission to set up a process first so that we know how we could actually start talking about this. This separate group has made a series of recommendations about how you could do a jury selection process using about 1,500 submissions, ideas from residents, ranging from, do you want to see Drew Brees on top of Lee Circle, or maybe Leah Chase, or <laughs> Fats Domino to some more conceptual kind of abstract uh, things. So, you know, it's, it's going to be a process. I think the one thing to remember, anything with monuments, you're dealing with regional or national memory. That's personal to people. And so this process is going to, they're going to have to take this very carefully, step by step, but I think they're starting to see some progress. So, And we're going to see some temporary ideas around? Yeah, you should start seeing in April and May, there's some um, 10 temporary monuments that are okay. put together by artists that this group helped commission through some of the submissions that they got okay. to help lead the, the citywide monument so process. So the process is just beginning. Yes. Okay, all right. Thanks a lot. Time to look ahead. Eat. Well, not the parades are starting, and there's a lot of satirical parades. And I, I did the, 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 what's going to be poked fun of the most this year is NFL referees. <laughs> and next week at this time, the crew d'etat uh, will be passing. This is a cup they're throwing. And uh, here's a referee uh, with a, <laughs> a, a, a clown referee with sunglasses. And over to the corner, if you all remember Buddy DiLiberto, um, anything Buddy DiLiberto didn't approve of, he referred to as squirrels. <laughs> right? And so there's an image of Buddy DiLiberto okay. referring to referees as squirrels. All right. That'll be next week. A cup to keep. All right. Mike. Well, uh, Perhaps by now, most people have heard of the retirement of Carl Arandando, chief meteorologist yeah. at WWL-TV, and it's because of a, a rare illness affecting his eyesight um, that could eventually render him blind. But he has been very brave and open sure about what he's going through, and there's going to be a special report on everything he's going through, including this disease, Tuesday night next right. week at 10 o'clock. Our best to call. All right, real quick. A week from Tuesday? I'll be doing my first group costume, lions and tigers and bears, oh my. We do have an oh my. I'll be the bear. Look for us in the French Quarter. Okay. <laughs> Jason. Um, one of the things that is so striking about the evolution of Carnival is the artistry of float making. Mm -hmm. And I predict that what Chewbacca's has done, the crew of Chewbacca's, these are film professionals who in their own time are making these extraordinary floats watch them. Okay. Thanks a lot, guys, for a very interesting conversation. Thank you for joining us. See you again next week for Informed Sources. Have a good evening.